We're glad to have Professor Jessica John Collins from Columbia University talking about imagining and deliberate, deliberative stance. Thanks, Hedy. And um, I just wanted to say that it is the same talk as described in the abstract I sent you. It's the title's changed. It was originally imaging and instability, but um, apart from a change in the order and emphasis of the topics, it's the same talk that you would have you're expecting. So, as I said a moment ago, I'm not guilty of bait and switch. Okay, so um, I should I'll start, and then I've got about 50 minutes of material and if I go straight through or else I don't know if your normal practice is to interrupt with questions on the way I'm certainly happy to do it that way if you if you prefer okay so um, I'm going to talk today about um, a theory that many of you most of you perhaps know as causal decision theory and I'm going to argue that there's a rather direct way of approaching causal decision theory that doesn't rely as the subject traditionally has on intuitions about wildly outlandish science fiction like examples but which depends rather on seeing what follows from the idea that there's something rather special about the stance of a deliberating agent so I'm going to argue that causal decision theory, or I'm going to actually ca going to call it CDT, because one of the upshots of all of this is that it's far from clear exactly the extent to which CDT is involved in the metaphysics of causation, for example. Um, and then uh, I'm going to introduce CDT by way of an explanation of the hypothetical revision method that's known as imaging. Again, I'm not sure exactly how much to um, assume here. Um, CDT is set up in several ways. I like the imaging approach because I think it's the most general and the least loaded with um, assumptions. Um, but I'll relate it to other perhaps more familiar presentations. Uh, the second main section after the introduction will be the direct argument for CDT, which I described a moment ago. Um, then we'll move on to discuss the so-called instability problems for causal decision theory. And I'm going to argue there that, again, focusing on what it is to be a deliberating agent, focusing in on what it is to occupy the deliberating stance is the secret to understanding how to deal with these difficult problems, in particular the problem of asymmetric instability that Andy Egan repopularized in a paper in 2007. And uh, then I'm going to conclude with some remarks about 19th century Russian literature, um, in particular um, the character of a 19th century Russian novel whom I think illustrates the deliberative stance as well as anything I can say here um, by not occupying it. And uh, I think the example of um, um, that, that, that example will perhaps um, e uh, explain also what I'm up to as well. Okay, so uh, the first section, CDT by imaging. Newcomb's problem. I assume, is everyone familiar here with Newcomb's problem? Um, let me do it for the camera anyway. It's a pretty broad audience. Though. Yeah, I'm not, again, I, it's not, it's not, uh, not all philosophers, not YouTube all. Too. I'm sorry? Our YouTube audience. Too. <laughs> yeah, okay. So look, here's the Newcomb problem. This is, this is the wild science fiction-like thought experiment that was thought to motivate the idea that causal considerations ought to be taken into account in thinking about the theory of decision. In Newcomb's problem there are two boxes in front of you on the table and one of them is transparent and can be seen to contain a thousand dollars. The other one is opaque and you know that it contains either one million dollars or nothing. And you're going to have to decide in a minute whether to take 
only the contents of the opaque box, call that the one box choice, or the contents of both boxes, call that the two box choice. Now the catch is this. You also know that a remarkably accurate predictor of human deliberation placed the million dollars in the opaque box yesterday, if and only if she then predicted that you would choose today to take only the contents of that box. You have great confidence in the predictor's reliability. What should you do? Now the interesting thing about this example is that there's widespread disagreement about what to do in this case. And the disagreement persists even up to the point of the people who are the experts in the field. Another interesting uh, aspect of this is that people usually, once they've understood the problem, form an opinion within a few seconds and then never revise their opinions, no matter what arguments are presented in favor of the opposing point of view. In fact, they will always evaluate the arguments, the goodness or badness of the argument in terms of um, the original intuition they had about the case. Now, of course, I have an opinion about this. I I'm, um, think it's quite obvious what to do in this case. You should take both boxes. And you should take both boxes because there's a simple dominance argument that says you should take both boxes. Whether or not the million dollars, if the million dollars is there, it was there yesterday. And if the box is empty, it was empty as of yesterday. And nothing you do now can have an effect on its contents. So whether or not the box contains the money, you're $1,000 better off taking both. So that's what you should do. Objectives will remind people like me that dominance arguments like the one I just described are only valid when outcomes are independent of choice. I reply, what do you mean by independent of choice? This case is interesting because the two senses in which we might consider whether outcomes are dependent on choice come apart, right? There's a clear statistical or probabilistic dependence on what you do, but there's causal independence. And it seems to me that in cases like that, the dominance argument is perfectly okay. Now, I'm not going to insist on that here. This is, I'm not arguing for um, uh, the two boxer position today. Rather, I'm simply going to assume that this is the correct answer to the problem and then see what kind of theory can deliver that sort of result. Okay, so um, let's think about what the opponent is going to say about this. The one boxer is going to say, look, there's, whatever the status of your dominance argument, there's a simple expected value argument in favor of taking only one box. And that is that the expected value of taking only one box, if we assume 99% accuracy on the predictor's part, is about $990,000, whereas the expected value of taking both boxes on, is only about $11,000. So the one boxes typically say to the two boxes, if you're so smart, why ain't you rich? So let's think about expected value. The two boxer is going to have to tell a story about expected value that shows where the mistake in that one boxer piece of argumentation lies. So let's quickly go through this. Here's a neutral presentation of expected value. Expected value is a probability weighted average of the ways that an option might be true. And the probability function P sub A there is what is, what going, to, is, is what's going to decide which flavor of expected value we think is appropriate. The evidentialist, so-called, the one boxer in Newcomb's problem, is going to say that the weighting of the ways A might be true is done using the usual orthodox method by taking the probabilities conditional on the proposition that you perform op option A. But the causalists the defenders of CDT 
um, like David Lewis, for example, say that this is a mistake. In Lewis's version of the theory, the causally expected value of an option A is calculated as, again as a probability weighted sum of um, uh, values of a certain sort. But the probabilities here are over all of what he, the possible dependency hypotheses as he calls them. And a dependency hypothesis is nothing but a full and complete description of the way the world, the way that the world might be depends upon what it is that you do. Alan Gibbard and Bill Harper published at around the same time in the late 1970s um, a version of CDT that appealed to not a conditional probability but the probability of a conditional in calculating expected value. So here the weighting is done by the probability of A box arrow W where A box arrow W is the subjunctive or counterfactual conditional proposition that if you were to choose A then W is the way that A would be true. And this looks as though it's pretty much equivalent to Lewis's version once you realize that a dependency hypothesis is simply a large conjunction of conditionals of this sort, one for each of the options that are available to the, uh, to the agent. So summing over the various dependency hypotheses is having the same effect as weighting the values of the ways that A might be true by subjunctive conditionals of this kind. Here's the version of the theory I like though. It's due to Howard Sobel and it appeals to a method called imaging. It says that when you calculate the expected value of A, you should weight the various ways that A might be true by the probability of W, not after conditionalizing on A, but after imaging on A. What is imaging? Well, let me give an informal description first and then I'll write down a formal definition. This diagram, the dots in the diagram represent possible worlds and the black dots represent possible worlds to which you've assigned prior probability greater than zero. So the proposition P here is simply the set of worlds um, that fall inside the support of your prior credence function. They're the worlds to which you assign a prior probability of greater than zero. And A is the proposition that we're going to accommodate by imaging. There are um, some um, A worlds that are consistent with what you currently assign non-zero probability to and other A worlds to which you currently assign probability zero. So imaging works like this. Unlike conditionalization where you, where you simply sweep the probability that's away, that's not on the proposition A and renormalize what's left so that it sums to one. In the case of imaging, we're going to relocate probability from the worlds on which it originally lies so that the probability from each world is going to be redistributed to a world at which A is true. And the arrows in the diagram here show how this is to be done. So for example, um, um, these two worlds are going to have their probability reassigned to this one. The two worlds at which A is already true, we're going to leave the probability fixed. And here's the interesting thing. This world here is going to reassign probability to an A world that previously had zero probability. Why is that? Because in a sense, this world is closest to this one. What does closest mean here? Well, in the diagram, it just means distance on the screen, right? Um, closeness um, might be thought to have something to do with um, the measure of comparative similarity of worlds that comes up in the, the lewis stalnaker analysis of the subjunctive conditional. I'm going to be open about that. I'm just going to say um, I'm not going to uh, 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 pass any judgments on what closeness is supposed to mean here, right? Because I want to leave it open, the extent to which what I'm claiming about CDT is committed to causal pictures. So this is the result of imaging then, right? 
the probability after we've imaged on A um, lies on the three worlds that are black on the diagram there. And as you can see, this is something you couldn't have gotten by conditionalization, because conditionalization is never going to raise the probability of a world from zero to something that's greater than zero. Okay, so let's think about um, the case of sharp imaging. Sharp imaging, as in the diagram I just drew, is where all of the probability is assigned from a world, a prior world, to an A world, to a single A world, right? Where um, the single A world closest to V is chosen by a selection function, SVA. This is a Stalnacker selection function. As I said, I'm not going to insist on any particular account of closeness here. But then we can write down the definition of imaging uh, in the following way. It's the sum over all the various worlds V of the product of the probability, the prior probability that's assigned to world V times 1 if V happens to be, oh, sorry, if W happens to be the closest A world to V and 0 otherwise. Um, in fact, though, it's helpful to be a little bit more liberal about the way imaging works and allow that probability might be spread out from an origin world to a number of different A worlds that are perhaps jointly the closest to the original world. In this case, the way to set this up is to say that there's a probability function PVA which assigns probability 1 to the proposition A. There's such a sharing function for each of the worlds V and then we can define imaging this way as the sum of the worlds V of the product of the original prior probability of V times whatever the sharing function for V ends up assigning to world W. And again, the idea is that in some sense of closest, the sharing function assigns positive value only to the A worlds that are closest to V. Now, Imaging is often presented in the literature as a rival to conditionalization. So it's important to correct that by observing that conditionalization is actually a special case of imaging. Right? Um, suppose we wish to obtain by imaging the result of conditionalizing on a proposition A. Then for any world V, we simply set the sharing function for V to be the function which gives the conditional probabilities on A. And then when we uh, take the sum, you see that imaging just um, imaging on that with that particular sharing function just amounts to conditionalization. Now, you might say, well, wait a minute. If we're going to define the sharing function this way, then when it comes to the worlds that are already A worlds, some of their probability is going to get taken away from them and redistributed over the, all of the various other A worlds, um, depending upon whatever the ratio of the original, the original ratio of probabilities between those worlds was. That's a violation. That would be in violation of what Lewis called the centering axiom for his logic of counterfactuals, right? The centering axiom says that every A world is the closest A world to itself, right? Nothing could be, no A world could be um, uh, closer to an A world than that A world is to itself, according to this centering axiom. Um, so if we want to hold on to strong centering here, um, we can still obtain conditionalization as strongly centered imaging um, by using this kind of definition, which is disjunctive, right? It does different things depending upon whether V is already an element of A or not. If V is already an element of A, then we let the sharing function for V be this sharp probability function that assigns everything to, uh, assigns probability to W only if W and uh, V are the same world. And for the worlds that are outside A originally, we do the definition as before. And uh, you can check pretty easily that this definition also gives you 
conditionalization by imaging. So one of the morals of this is then that I think of CDT not as a rival to the evidential theory that says that expected value should be calculated by um, using conditionalization, but rather as a relaxation of that theory, a more permissive account of rational choice that doesn't insist that you image in this one particular way. Any imaging function is okay. So now for the Newcomb problem, let's change the numbers a bit so that the, the numbers are now, there's one dollar in the transparent box and ten dollars perhaps in the opaque box. And let's assume that the predictor is 90% accurate, then a typical kind of way of calculating expected value according to the causal theory, according to CDT, um, uses a value matrix and a credence matrix like this. Here X is a parameter that gives you whatever the agent, agent's credence is for making the one box choice, right? So X is the probability that the agent assigns while deliberating to the one box choice being the result of the deliberation. And if that number is X, then the probability that, um, that um, she'll take the two box choice is, is one minus X. And then imaging here goes up and down the columns. Why is that? Well, because the agent thinks that this is the closest one box world to that and vice versa, and that this is the closest two box world to this world and vice versa. And perhaps that reflects the idea that the agent is convinced that whether or not the money is there, the money's there or not, is now something that is fixed and not subject to the agent's control. So when we image on the one box option, the probability that was there gets added to that, and the probability that was there gets added to that, and we have these um, new post-imaging credences. And then we calculate the causal expected value here, or the CEV, by uh, multiplying this probability by 10 and this by zero, and we see that the causal expected value of the one box choice is 1 plus 8x, whatever x is. Similarly, if we do the same thing on the two box option and make the same calculation, multiplying this value by 11 and that value by 1 and adding them together, we get the causal expected value of the two box choice being 2 plus 8x. And this is the way that the imaging method underwrites the dominance argument. The claim is now, look, it doesn't matter what x is. The expected value of the two box choice is always one greater than the expected value of the one box choice. And that's why we should take both boxes. Okay, so after that quick run through the theory of imaging and the way that this method gets applied to the Newcomb problem, let me move to the direct argument for CDT. And why feel the need for a direct argument here? Well, because, as I said at the outset, the debate about, the debate between the causal and evidential theories, so-called, has focused on our intuitions about science fiction-like examples of the Newcomb problem sort. And opponents of CDT have quite reasonably complained that our intuitions about such wildly outlandish cases are simply not firm enough, that those cases themselves are not important enough to warrant making a fundamental change to orthodox theory. So as um, Dick Jeffrey once memorably commented, Newcomb's problem is just a prisoner's, a prisoner's dilemma for space cadets to which we should apply the thought of the late Esther Markovitz. If cows had wings, we would all carry umbrellas. He was not moved by this sort of argument at all. So. Um, let me add at this point too, there, there have been attempts to come up with more realistic versions of the Newcomb problem, so-called medical Newcomb problems, where, for example, the agent is convinced that the correlation between smoking and lung cancer is 
is the result not of a direct causal connection between smoking and developing cancer, but as the result perhaps of a common genetic predisposition. And the thought is there that, you know, if you're contemplating whether or not to smoke, then you should think about what your smoking is likely to bring about from a causal point of view rather than just look, uh, look at the conditional probabilities. And you either have the gene or you don't, like the money's in the box or it's not. And if you have the gene, you might be happier smoking than not. Of course, you have bad news that you're likely to get cancer, but cancer and smoking is better than cancer and not smoking, you think. Um, similarly, right? So you see how that, how that goes. The trouble is that this, this, these efforts to kind of come up with these more realistic versions also run into a kind of stalemate because defenders of the evidential theory say, look, in these realistic cases, like the medical cases, there'll always be extra information you, the agent, have. For example, whether or not you have a craving for a cigarette, right? Um, and once you've, uh, once you've incorporated the information that you either have the craving or don't have the craving, that's going to serve to screen off the previous correlation, so you'll no longer find yourself in a Newcomb problem. So, the you know, this, is, this is known in the, in the literature as the tickle defense, right? The tickle is the craving or whatever it is that indicates to you, the agent, that, um, that you want whatever it is you want. So my idea is to offer a more direct argument for CDT, an argument that doesn't depend about intuitions about particular problem cases. It's going to proceed immediately from a consideration of what it's like to be a deliberating agent According to this argument, a commitment to CDT is a prerequisite for viewing yourself as having and exercising agency in the world. And this is the way the argument goes. First premise, I've broken it up into two parts. Learning the truth requires conditionalization, but making true requires imaging. Second premise, agency is a matter of making true not of learning the truth. Third premise, deliberation requires viewing oneself as an agent, so deliberation requires imaging. And if deliberation requires imaging, well, that's exactly what the defender of CDT has been claiming all along. Um, I'm going to focus here now on why we should think that 1B is true. I assume, let me assume for the time being that agency is a matter of making true and that deliberation requires viewing yourself as an agent. Um, why should we think that making true requires imaging? Well, there's an old 1992 paper of Katsuno and Mendelssohn. Katsuno and Mendelssohn were computer scientists, are computer scientists, not um, philosophers. And this is a paper that probably deserves to be better known and more widely discussed in the philosophical literature. But they distinguish two ways in which you might adjust a database. One way is what they call revising it, and the other is updating it. I think the terminology is a little unfortunate, but that's what they said. They say, update consists of bringing the knowledge base up to date when the world described by it changes. Revision, on the other hand, is used when we are obtaining new information about a static world. Revision for them is AGM belief revision, and their update operator turns out to be nothing other than a non-probabilistic version of imaging. So, um, 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 they think that there are direct considerations that favor an imaging-like revision method when we're thinking about bringing a knowledge base up to date when the world that is described by it changes. Um, example. Here's an example that's actually simpler than the ones that Katsuno and Mendelssohn give in their original paper, and this example is due to uh, Mikhail Kozic. I call it Kozic's lunchbox. Um, let A be the claim that my closed lunchbox contains an apple. B the claim that it contains a banana. I know that it contains just an apple, just a banana, or both. In fact, my credence is divided evenly between the possible states 
in which it contains just an apple, just a banana, or both, to each of which I assign probability one-third. So the picture looks like that. Initially, each of these worlds has probability one-third, or each of these states has probability one-third, and I don't know which is true. When I conditionalize on the fact that there's no, you know, suppose somebody peeks and tells me that there's no banana in the lunchbox, um, I update by conditionalizing here, or I, um, I shouldn't use the word update since that's not a Katsuna Mendelssohn word, but I revise by conditionalizing, and now all of the probability is uh, assigned uh, to the state where there's an apple and no banana. On the other hand, suppose that I somehow see to it that it's made true that there's no banana in the lunchbox. Suppose I send someone and say, look, look in the lunchbox, and if there's a banana in there, take it out. How should I, um, how should I um, respond to that? Well, there, the Katsuna Mendelssohn idea is that this is the kind of case where I'm going to update the database by recognizing that the world it describes may have changed, and this is done by imaging, right? So the probability that gets assigned to the state A, B is going to be reassigned to the state A and not B, and that which was assigned to B and not A is going to get reassigned to not B and not A. This is, in each case, removing the, removing the banana, and if there's no banana there, nothing happens, so the probability simply stays where it is, right? So this is a kind of um, a uh, typical case where, that Katsuna and Mendelssohn have in mind. That's the result of imaging on the negation of B, and it's not the same, right? Because when you conditionalized, so this is the result of imaging on uh, the negation of B, it's not the same as conditionalization. Conditionalization left all of the probability here. Now two-thirds is here and one-third is there. And I've colored this one a little darker to indicate that that's where most of the probability is. Uh, so that's the argument, that's, that in a nutshell is the argument for um, making true, requiring imaging. And when I first saw this paper a long, long time ago, I thought, wait a minute, there's a confusion here of states and worlds, right? They're doing, they're, they're, they're uh, revising on states of a system, but surely what we should be interested in, if we want to leave open the possibility that the system is changing over time, is not particular states of the system, but histories of the states through which the system pa passes, right? Which we can call, you know, uh, um, histories or worlds, right? And the thought is, look, once we move to a representation of this problem that includes temporal considerations that assigns probability to worlds rather than states, then conditionalization will be up to the task, right, of both tasks. Right. So let's do it this way, right? I've now the, 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 these um, four bold-faced squares um, are the states at time one. Um, A1 is uh, the, uh, there being a, an apple in the lunchbox at time one, etc. And each of these is subdivided into the possible states the system may be in at time two, right? And again, if you initially think there's either an apple or a banana or both, the probability is going to get assigned to here, and then you might divide it up evenly if you've got no th initial thoughts about what might happen at the later time. And now conditionalization can surely deal with both cases. If we learn B, that, if we learn that B is and always was false, what we're going to do is conditionalize on the proposition A1 if and only if A2, B1 if and only if B2, and not B2. On the other hand, if we're going to make B false, if it isn't already false, we're going to conditionalize as well, but on the proposition that drops the conjunct that B has to be the same, the B state of the system has to be the same at the earlier time and the later time. So we now conditionalize on A1 if and only if A2, and not B2. So that's what happens after we learn that there's no banana and there wasn't a banana in the, in the box. 
again, all of the probability ends up in the lower left corner here, where there's uh, an, a, an apple and uh, no banana there, um, both at the first time and at the second time. On the other hand, when we conditionalize after learning that B has been made false, the probability ends up here, here, and here, and you can reconstruct the results of the Katsuno Mendelssohn imaging on states from this world diagram by taking the four bold-faced squares, stacking them on top of one another, and summing the probability on the superimposed cells that results once you've stacked those squares. So the one-third here gets added to the one-third there when that's stacked on top of that, and one-third that's here gets added to there when that's stacked on top of that. Right? So again, this, you know, no big deal, right? Um, it's not that imaging is required for making true, it's just that we were conditionalizing on the wrong thing and we were led to conditionalize on the wrong thing because we were working with a representation that didn't have temporal considerations built into it. Well, I was convinced by that objection for a long time, but now I think there's a way of replying to it. The objector has pointed out that both learning that B is false and learning that B has been made false can be accommodated by conditionalization once we move from the state representation to the world representation. But learning that something has been made true is still a way of learning, not a way of doing. The mistake the objector is making is rather like the mistake made by someone who notes that one cannot change the past and then concludes that time travel to the past is an impossibility. But again, as Lewis pointed out, backward causation requires only the ability to affect the past, not the ability to change it. Having the ability to affect the past just means that had you done something other than what you actually did, the past would have been different. That's a modal notion, not a temporal one. Change is a temporal notion. Something changes when it was first one way and then a later way. And I think the same thing is going on here. Um, um, Katsuno and Mendelssohn make things harder for themselves by describing everything in temporal terms. But they shouldn't have, right? They should have simply said, what's wrong with the idea that you conditionalize when you make true is that you are ignoring the probability that gets assigned to certain ways you think the actual world might be. Um, let me just add at this point, it might, it might help or it might not help to think here about the deterministic case, right? Suppose you're an agent, but you also believe the world is deterministic. You believe you have agency because you're a compatibilist about free will in a deterministic world. Um, suppose that you are a one-boxer and uh, in the actual world, the actual world is one in which you're going to take the contents of only the opaque box in Newcomb problem, you should still, according to the Katsuna Mendelssohn uh, thought, take the world in which you two box, i.e. the closest world to the actual world in which you take both boxes, into consideration in thinking about it, when you're contemplating doing something in this situation. Um, because here, it's not as though there are branching futures. There's nothing to change. If we use at as a rigid designator for the actual world, it's not as though in this other world, at has changed from an earlier way it was to a later way it was. No, the point remains, you should consider how things would have been were you to have done something other than what it is you do. So I no longer think that the objection works and I think that the Katsuna Mendelssohn idea is sound but the right way to present it is not in temporalized terms as they do but to present it as a strictly modal point. Okay, the next section, instability and indeterminacy. 
In the original 1978 paper on CDT, Gibbon and Harper gave an example of an unstable decision problem, death in Damascus. A more troublesome kind of asymmetric problem was first discussed by Richter and Weyrich back in the 80s and then brought back to our attention by Andy Egan in a paper in 2007. Here's the death in Damascus case. It's based, I think, on a story of Somerset Morms called Appointment in Samara. Um, a man meets death in the marketplace in Damascus. Death seems surprised and says, I was expected to come to you tomorrow in Aleppo. The man can avoid death only if he manages tomorrow not to be at the place of his appointment. He can choose either to stay in Damascus or to travel to Aleppo. As the man knows, death is a good predictor of his future whereabouts. Wherever the man decides to be tomorrow, that's going to be evidence that he would be better off in the other place. What does he do? Well, if we do a calculation like the one we did before for Newcomb's problem, we're going to see that the causal expected value of staying in Damascus is 9 minus 8x, where x is the initial probability that that's what you're going to, that you're going to stay in Damascus. And the causal expected value of going to Aleppo is 1 plus 8x. And now we see something strange here. The causal expected value of staying in Damascus is greater than that of going to Aleppo, if and only if you think it's more likely than not that you're not going to do it, right? Now, surely this is the wrong deliverance, right? It's clear that the man should be indifferent between the two terrible options. But note that CDT, as we so far developed it, does not deliver this result. What, CD, what CDT tells us is that if the man thinks it's more probable that he will remain in Damascus, then the utility of going to Aleppo is higher. But if he then thinks it's more probable that he will go to Aleppo, that makes the utility of remaining in Damascus higher than fleeing. In Dick Jeffrey's terminology, neither of the available options is ratifiable, where an option is said to be ratifiable just in case the utility of choosing it, conditional on the information that one does choose it, is at least as high as the utility of any other option. So instability problems are precisely those in which there is no ratifiable option. In a 1990 book, Brian Skirms turned this into an elegant theory of deliberation. The book is called The Dynamics of Rational Deliberation. And the thought was this. Some problems have ratifiable fixed points. For other problems for which there's no ratifiable option, they're to be classified according to the particular pattern of instability that emerges in the Skirmsian dynamics. Harry, you have a question? Or? How, how, uh, is utility supposed to be interpreted as a subjective notion? Yes. Or? Oops. Um, yep. So could, could you go back a slide or two? I, I just mm -hmm. tried to... Uh, uh, oh, sorry. I went wrong way. Maybe the one that says that with the x is less than a half, the, just that slide. Yeah. So um, I, didn't, I, I, didn't, I didn't process the ratifiability and how that might play on this, this calculation. But well, what this means is that you know, x is going to be, if you think you're going to stay in Damascus, x is going to be close to 1. And if x is close to 1, then Aleppo looks better. But once Aleppo starts to look better, the, pr the value of x is going to go close to 0. And once it drops below 0.5, Damascus starts looking better again. So if it's, it's enough to kill him. <laughs> yeah. So, so is that adding more dynamics? To, I mean, so the, the, the calculation, right. is, is that made? Yeah, that well, the, the way Scum's modeled it was to say that you, you kind of incrementally are updating by something like Jeffrey conditionalization, getting, you know, bit by bit by bit. And at each stage of the partial conditionalization, you recalculate expected value, and you use that to tell you which direction to do the next partial conditionalization. So you get these kind of paths through um, the, probability, the, the probability space over the options that may not have a fixed point, but may, in this case, loop back and forwards, right? 
or arrive at a, in this case, I guess it's going to arrive at um, um, the value x equals 0.5, where the agent is, um, has not made a decision. So with x, what does x mean? Uh, x, x, is the, x is the credence, whatever the agent's credence is, during the deliberation for making this choice. And CEV, that's a utility. And CEV is expected, the expected utility expected. of making that choice done the imaging way. So if the credence, uh, I guess I'm trying to kind of make sense of this within uh, in some way your, your argument is to say that this doesn't make sense. I, I suppose that there's some, but it's hard to make sense of this, I suppose. Yeah. So, but if, um, if utility is just the way I'm looking, if, if I think, so what, utility is how I'm, uh, let me, let me uh, gather my thoughts and I'll, I'll come back to this. Okay, it might, it might actually become clearer as I get a little bit so further along. What I'm, well, yeah, I'm trying yeah. to kind of make sense of it my, my own way. But I mean, the, okay. there, there seems to be a, um, th there must be a difference between utility and credence that is, uh, seems to be suggesting that once you see that your utility would be higher, then right. that starts to affect your credence. Sure. If you, if, uh, once, you, once your utility for um, staying in Damascus is higher than the utility of going to Aleppo, surely that's going to increase your credence that you're going to be in Damascus tomorrow. That's the thought. And so as that credence rises, Damascus becomes a less and less attractive op option. So the credence X falls. And Skirms' idea was to track the dynamics of change of credence and change in utility. Okay. So this as, that that de as that deliberative process evolved. Right? Okay, so the dynamics are allowing the credence to depend on the utility as well as the Right, utility. so it was a feedback loop, yeah. But now this was the point that Warwick and Richter made, and which uh, Andy Egan um, um, reintroduced to the literature. Suppose we introduce a slight asymmetry into the story. So suppose we know, suppose the man knows that there's a good restaurant on the road to Aleppo, where at least he'll be able to enjoy a wonderful last meal. The value he assigns to the pleasant meal is outweighed by the disutility of meeting death. This asymmetry changes nothing much in the deliberative dynamic story, but that's unacceptable. Because in the asymmetric version of the, of the problem, it's now obvious that the man should go to Aleppo. The dynamic theory can't distinguish cases like the original one, in which instability in the dynamics gets interpreted as indifference, from cases in which there is or should be clear preference despite lack of a ratifiable option. So these asymmetric instability examples do pose a real problem for causal decision theory. And Andy Egan said, these are, I think, fatal problems for the causal theory. Wyrick responded, Egan's examples do not refute the theory but present a challenge to it. Although decision instability is an open problem, causal decision theory has resources for addressing it. So now, let's think about this. In the previous slide, or in a previous slide, I underwrote the dominance argument in Newcomb's problem by showing that the causal expected uh, utilities of the two choices could be written in terms of this parameter x, where x was the agent's subjective probability while deliberating of making the one box choice. But perhaps we should be suspicious of these pre-choice or during deliberation probabilities for acts. This kind of suspicion has led some to propose the following thesis. And the thesis is one which has been defended by, um, I guess most notably, Wolfgang Spohn and my colleague, colleague Isaac Levi. Uh, and Levi expresses the thesis this way, deliberation crowds out prediction, by which he means that it's incoherent to suppose that a deliberating agent assigns any subjective probabilities at all to the options about which she's currently deliberating. Note that the impossibility of assigning probabilities to acts that one's currently deliberating about is a first-person present tense blind spot phenomenon, according to this 
um, thesis. Because I can coherently assign a probability to the proposition that another person will choose to do A, I can coherently assign a probability to the proposition that in some future deliberation, I myself will choose to do A. The claim is simply one about the incoherence of assigning these credences to one's own options while in the very process of deliberating about them. And I propose that this is the key to understanding the instability cases. I propose that we should not treat the x that appears in the above matrices and formulas as a variable whose value is the agent's credence for one of her options. Rather, it's a placeholder indicating that the agent recognizes that she has it within her power either to make x equal to zero if she chooses not to take that option or to make x equal to one if she does. So I think that an agent's credence for each available option while she's deliberating is indeterminate and should really be given by an ordered pair. The ordered pair 0, 1. The value that, because these are the two values that she can make that proposition have. And the agent's credence for the conjunction of an option in a row and a state in a column is going to be given by an ordered pair 0 x, where x is whatever the conditional credence the agent assigns to that state given that she chooses that option. Right? So now she thinks, I can't make it the case that I choose one box and the million dollars is there, but I can either make that false or I can make it have probability 0.9 if I believe the predictor is 90% accurate. These indeterminate option credences combine with values to yield indeterminate expected values for options. Suppose x is the parameter that takes the value 1 when option A is chosen and 0 otherwise. When a causal expected value takes an ordered pair, indeterminate ordered pair value AB, I mean that A is the expected value of the option calculated by imaging on A and then letting the parameter x take the value 0. And the corresponding value B arises when you image on to taking that option and then let the parameter x take the value 1. And the mnemonic for interpreting these ordered pair expected values is don't do, right? A is the value when you don't choose it, and B is the value when you consider yourself to choose it. So now, recalculating expected values for the Newcomb problem with these indeterminate credences, right? What we're doing is basically just the same, but I've rewritten it so that it no longer looks as though we're assigning a probability to making a choice while we're deliberating. We image on the one box option and the probability that was here gets reassigned up there, but note that doing, thi doing this amounts to not doing this. So when the probability gets reassigned, this ordered pair gets flipped and that value gets added over there rather than to there, right? So imaging on the one box option, we get these updated indeterminate credences and then when we multiply by the values of the outcomes, we get 10 times this plus 0 times that and 10 times this is the ordered pair 1, 9, right? Where 1 corresponds to the value of not making the one box choice and 9 is the value of making it, right? Uh, on the two box option, similarly, we do the similar calculation. 11 times this plus 1 times that gives you the ordered pair 10, 2. And now the question is, how do we compare these ordered pairs? Right? How does 1, 9 compare to 10, 2? And what I'm doing here is providing a calculus for making sense of what the two boxer does, making sense of what CDT demands in this case. 
So I say, you know, in cases like this, where the maximum value of one ordered pair is greater than the maximum value of the other, and the minimum value is greater than the minimum value of the other, uh, you take the dominant option. Now the arrows here indicate which way round the ordered pairs were, right? So an arrow going, the arrow goes from the value on the left of the ordered pair to the value on the right of the ordered pair. So Newcomb's problem doesn't actually look like this, right? It's still a case of dominance. But in the Newcomb problem, 10, 2, the arrow goes this way because 10 was the left-hand value and 2 was the right-hand value. And here, 1, 9, the arrow goes from left to right because 1 was the left-hand value in the ordered pair and 9 was the right-hand value. But the thought is that despite the fact that the arrows go in different directions, you still choose the dominant option even when the dominant option is unratifiable. Right? Ratifiability here is now the case where the arrow goes from the higher valued number to the lower valued one, right? In the asymmetric instability case, right, this is Aleppo with the re good restaurant on the road there. This is staying in Damascus. Each ends up having an ordered pair value where the larger number is on the left. That means that each is unratifiable. But the thought is, in this case too, let the dominant option be chosen even when the two cases, even when the two options are unratifiable. Um, I'm going to jump through the next, I, I should, I'm running a little short of time now perhaps, so should I jump through the next section and... It's up to you. I'm, uh, sorry? We usually have a long question and answer session, so it's... Okay. So maybe, look, maybe I'll, I'll run through this, skip ahead through this, and we can come back to it if people want to in the question, in the Q&A, um, or, uh, or not, because I, I want to get onto the stuff that follows this, and I don't want to run out of time. Okay. So, let me just pause and say what I've, what I've done here, right? What I've done is suggested that there's a way of taking the Levi Spohn idea that deliberation crowds out predictions seriously and using it in a calculus that gives us indeterminate expected values based on indeterminate credences for one's current, uh, the outcomes of one's current choice in order to deliver consistent results in the instability cases. But that of course depends upon one being able to defend the crowding out thesis. And that thesis has recently come under attack by Alan Hayek in a paper where he pejoratively refers to it, refers to it as the dark, dark thesis, D-A-R-C, um, an acronym for deliberation annihilate, annihilates rational credence. So, Hayek gives a number of arguments in that paper against the idea that deliberation crowds out prediction. But it seems to me that he misstates the thesis at the very outset when he says, here is their view, they being um, me and the other defenders of the, um, the crowding out thesis. While deliberating about what you'll do, you cannot rationally have credences for what you'll do. Well, that's not quite right. I don't think the thesis imposes any constraint on rational credence. Rather, what I want to say is that it says something about what's involved in adopting the stance of a deliberating agent. It's about what it is to view yourself from the first person perspective as an agent who has the ability to make this true or that true, rather than being a passive third person observer, uh, adopting the passive perspective of a subject who's merely learning what gets done. 
So I think Hayek also misses the point when he says one cannot have the credences for one's own options while deliberating, for short option credences, on pain of irrationality. In a slogan, the thesis is that option credences are irrational. Well, again, I say that's not the point. Suppose you're deciding whether or not to order the red wine. Are you going to order the red or the white? I don't think it's irrational to view yourself from the third person perspective and predict that you'll end up choosing the red or for example to say or think it's 80% likely I'll end up choosing the red wine. It's just that doing so undermines, is undermining of the deliberative stance. Such thoughts have to be bracketed for a deliberating agent, right? It's not that they can't be there or that they're irrational. It's just that they don't properly come into play when you're deliberating. So Hayek gives an argument. He gives several arguments against the thesis. And I'll just look at the first two because my responses to them will also, in various uh, versions, be my responses to the other argument he makes. Hayek says, look, credence is our best model of uncertainty. And surely a deliberating agent is uncertain about what you'll do. So surely a deliberating agent assigns credences to the various outcomes of the current deliberative episode. Well, my reply, there's a potential gap here between lacking certainty construed negatively and being uncertain taken positively. Suppose you lack a credence for P then you're clearly not certain at P, whether or not you think it's also okay to say that you're uncertain, right? It now seems to me, I mean, that, that was my original response to Alan, and then I thought, you know, it now seems to me better to grant that the deliberating agent is uncertain. It's just that her uncertainty, as given by the option credences, are outside the scope of the deliberation. Hayek's second argument against the thesis. The thesis requires radically anti-Bayesian revision of credence whenever an agent commences or ceases deliberating. Well, no, not at all. Adopting the, the, adopting the deliberative stance does not involve any sort of revision of credence. Right? It just amounts to taking yourself now to be deliberating about what to do. So it's not as though you change your credences while, uh, when you begin deliberating and change your credences again when you cease deliberating. It's just that some of your credences become bracketed, i.e. not relevant for consideration, once the deliberative episode begins and once you've occupied the deliberative stance. But from exactly with stance or bracket or certain stances? Well, you to, just to don't think about them? Um, you recognize them. It's, I've got an analogy coming up that might help or it might not. Let me try the analogy first and then see um, if that helps you, helps make it clear with the, what, um, what I've got in mind at the moment. The analogy is with the case of promising. Okay? and what you might think of as the promissory stance. So suppose I say to you, I borrow $20 from you and I say, I promise to pay you back on Friday. When I say I promise to pay you back on Friday, I'm not attempting to assert a truth. I'm not making a prediction about what will happen on Friday. I'm doing something quite different. I'm performing a speech act. I'm performing the speech act of making a promise and incurring a commitment, right? So it seems to me that the, the, the sentence, I promise to pay you back on Friday, is neither true nor false. It's an act that makes me committed to do a certain thing on Friday, namely pay you back, right? I mean, if you're in a wedding ceremony and somebody asks you, do you take this blah, 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 and you say, I do. You're not asserting a truth. Rather, you're performing the act of getting married, right? It's a similar kind of thing. What's the difference between saying I 
Um, the, the second might be taken to be a prediction. The first conventionally is not a prediction. It's a standard form of incurring a commitment, like signing a contract. So I think I, you know, I, I, will, I will pay you back on Friday it might be ambiguous, right? It might be ambiguous between a third person predictive reading where I'm just saying what I think will happen. In other words, I'm making an autobiographical claim about what my future self will do. Or I guess there are ways in which you could use I will do this in order to indicate that you're committing yourself to do it. But certainly the form of words I promise to or I promise that is pretty clearly on... The line that you're making a prediction seems to undermine... The this is the point. Thing. This is the point, right? Promising crowds out prediction. Right? That's exactly the point. Well, I didn't mean it like that. Oh! <laughs> You meant it to be an objection. <laughs> you're, you're, you're right that it would be inappropriate. Mm -hmm. say, say, but it seems to be inappropriate because you're in promising, you're also predicting. I'm not sure about that. Well, anyway, let me, a, let me, a, let me, a, let me, let me, let me, what you say about that. Yeah, let me say what I say and then we can come back to that. That's not to say it's irrational or inconsistent for me to say or think. I promise to pay you back on Friday, but of course I may not, right? Because of course I recognize I'm fallible, I, rec I might get hit by a bus on Thursday, right? Okay? It's just that the prediction has to be outside the scope of the promise, right? This. I promise to pay you back, but mind you, I'm not predicting that I will. Or even the way you said it there. Uh, Somebody said that to me. I wouldn't. Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't be looking to get the twenty dollars back on Friday. Precisely because because sorry. What if I say I promise to pay you back on Friday, but I might not? I think if, if you said that to me, I'd figure well, I'm not going to get it. Sure, because <laughs> the thought is that if the I might not is included within the scope of the promise, it sabotages the act of incurring the commitment. Right? It sabotages your sincerity as a promiser. How is it not going to be, if you say it at the same time, how is it not going to be included in the scope of the promise? It's, uh, it seems to make the promise in, fel in felicitous to use that. Right. That seems okay. to count but this against, is a, uh, count against? Against your view that, I mean, that it's undermining the promising, so it's not that promising makes it inappropriate yeah, actually, I take that Yeah, I mean, look, the claim here is that in the case of promising, saying, I promise to do this, but I may not, suggests that what you're promising is to do something you might not do. And that's, that's self-undermining, right? So I want to say, look, prediction of that sort undermines the promissory stance it's not that you can't, you know, silently to yourself recognize that you may fail. It's just that you can't say it out loud without endangering judgments of your own sincerity, right? But what, when you say prediction undermines the promissory stance, right. do you mean saying I might not would undermine the promissory stance? Right, but also saying, you know, uh, predicting that you will do what you've promised is just, it it's adds nothing, right? It adds nothing by way of better, commitment. Better than, uh, right. What, that, your last sentence, what are you saying? Are you saying that, are you referring to I will as the prediction or I might not as the prediction? Um, either one. One is, one, is, um, uh, one is superfluous and the other is so, so do undermining. Feel, do you feel the superfluous one is undermining? No, it's just superfluous. So again, it has no role to play in the incurring of the commitment, right? It's outside the scope. It's outside the scope of promising. So I would think of a promise as a statement of your best intentions at the, mo at the moment you make the statement. 
whereas a pro or as a prediction is a, is a statement. But best, well, it depends what you mean. Yeah. Are talking at the moment you're relative to the moment you're speaking. They're two different things. Well, what do you mean by best intentions, right? Well, uh, maybe I'll say best intentions, but a statement of intention. It's a statement of intent. Just right. I guess at but the it's more than that. It's a commitment not to change your intent. Right? I mean, I can say to you, look, um, I'm planning to go to Syracuse this weekend, right? And that's a statement of my best intention. But if the time comes, the next Saturday I'm in New York City, you're not going to say to me, look, you told me your best intention was to be in Syracuse and you're not there. I say, yeah, I changed my mind. Right? So I don't think promising is an expression of a best intention. It's a commitment. It's a commitment to do this and not to change your mind about doing it. So it's a commitment to somebody else. It's a social yeah, thing. Yeah, it's a social thing. It's a commitment. So, but, right. so the you want to make an analogy to that and yeah. be, with, with, be the deliverer. Well, I'm, I'm, what I'm saying is the prediction is as inappropriate in, yeah, I see that. The, in, the, in, the, in the act of promising. Predicting is inappropriate, it might and it's inappropriate for analogous reasons in the case of deliberating. I mean, it would, it would, in the case of a because the prediction that, ceremony, if somebody right. said, "I do, but I won't." <laughs> I do, but I won't. <laughs> or later, or later, or later, your spouse says, "You said you did," and you said, "I lied," right? No, you might. I mean, in fact, it seems like maybe the prediction is not excluded because mm -hmm. because. Uh, the promise might be buttressed by, hey, I will get paid uh, on Friday, and, and that's right. why I can pay you back. And, uh, and so you, you adding right. predictions to this would buttress the uh, Right. But I think it in, it in no way adds to or takes away from the fact that you're committed. Right? Once you're committed, the prediction doesn't add anything by way of commitment. On the other hand, if you predict that you won't do what you're committing what yourself to do, it? then you're undermining the... What would, what would it mean for me to say that I believe your promise? I'm, well, again, I'm, you know, I, I think that's a way, I think that's a way of saying... It doesn't just mean that I believe you promised. No, it means something like I believe you're sincere. Right. Again, I don't think of promising as a, I don't think of promising as fact as a fact stating thing. I don't think that, you know. I promise to pay you back on Friday. Well, it, I promise to pay you back on Friday. Am I making an autobiographical claim about myself? No. Here's another look. Here's another analogy. Stephanie Beardman on the reflection principle, right? Stephanie makes a very similar point about Van Frossen's reflection principle. She says, the statement, I believe that P, may be taken in one of two ways. It might be a simple piece of autobiographical reporting, the reporting of a claim made true by the fact I so believe, right? And so, you know, I promise to pay you back on Friday might be taken to be a simple piece of autobiographical reporting. The reporting of the claim made true by the fact that I so, uh, that I uttered the words, I promise to pay you back on Friday. But that's surely not the normal reading, right? The normal reading of, I promise to pay you back on Friday is performing the act of incurring a commitment. And the natural reading of, I believe that P is to take it not to be fact stating, but to be an instance of the act of a vowel, right? You are vouching for the truth of P. You say, I believe that P, and you're saying, P is true, believe me. Right? If it's taken as an act of a vowel, an expression of my belief, and it's, a, it's an expression of my belief that P rather than a statement of my belief that P. Taking this second way from the first, from the present tense, first person point of view, the statement, I believe that P, is non-factual. So Stephanie's defense of reflection, reflection is the principle that says that 
if you now believe that you believe, if you now believe that you will believe that P, then you should believe that P. Right. And there are all sorts of, you know, apparent counterexamples to this. If you take it as a diachronic principle on rationality, right? Patrick Ma says, look, does reflection commit me to the idea that after the party tonight when I've had 10 drinks, I believe I'll be able to drive home safely. Hence, I should believe now that after I've had 10 drinks, I should be able to drive home safely. Right? They say, oh, this, like, well, you know, maybe this does, reflection doesn't um, uh, apply to cases where there's predicted irrationality or predicted memory loss, or, you know, I've got a counterexample to reflection that involves even your lack of ability to track the passage of time, right? Surely all of these things are not built into the notion of what it's now rational to believe. And Stephanie says, look, these various counterexamples are kind of irrelevant to Van Frossen's point because surely Van Frossen intended the principle to be interpreted as governing the logic of first person present tense avowal of belief rather than autobi autobiographical statements that you so believe. And as identifying the avowal P and I will believe that not P as undermining of the utterer's status as a testimonial agent. Right? So this is the point of Moore's paradox, right? It's not that when you say P and I believe that not P, or P and I will believe that not P, it's not that you're stating something that couldn't possibly be true, because after all, we all recognize we're fallible. But as in the case of promising, adding the prediction that you'll change your mind about P undermines your current status as a giver of testimony. But I think that Stephanie had a way of making sense yeah. of the principle. But I yeah. don't think that this was fun, what Van Crossen intended. Well, he, I, he uh, Stephanie told me that she got an email from him. She showed me the email. You can't, that, and he you said, can't, that's what I meant. But you can't believe anything he says. <laughs> Where, isn't the, hey, the camera's rolling, right? <laughs> <laughs> he, be, he being boss. Possibly. Well, boss, boss, boss says to Stephanie, that's exactly what I meant. That's exactly what I meant all along. And you've put it better than I managed to, to do that. So good luck to you, right? So again, this is a case, I think, very much like the case of deliberation. That, you know, within the testimonial stance, you undermine your testimony by violating reflection. So, so this map, there's at least you, you have to say a little bit more. Yeah. Because in the avowal case or the promising case, it's intersocial. You're doing right. It, it, it's a communicative act with somebody else in the in the uh, deliberative. Yeah, it's just yeah. you, but it's you and you qua deliberator, right? So you divide yourself into uh, it's two not, and yeah. communicate. So you're. Your idea of the stance is that you're, the two of you, is you the deliberator, you the... Yeah, well, I think that's a very artificial way of putting it, but I can certainly, I can certainly, you know, while, you know, I, I think, right, were I not currently deliberating about this, these would be my credences, right? But I am deliberating about this. So I can't coherently bring those, pr bring those credences to play, into play. That's the thought. Does that mean I'm a, a divided self in some respects? I don't, I don't think so, but. Okay, so, um, um, you know, modulo the bit that I left out where I look at these other cases that Andy considered where, you know, there's no dominant option, but you still might think we have a reason to do one thing rather than the other, and I want to have a s kind of coherent story to tell about that. That's less important than what followed. So I wanted to get to this, given that we're running out of time. But this is the conclusion, right? What would it be like? What would it be like not, systematically not, to adopt the deliberative stance towards your own decision making? Well, this is where we get to the Russian literature. There's the case of Oblomov, Ilya Ilyich Oblomov, who is the hero, if you the eponymous hero, if uh, he deserves that appellation. Never gets out of bed. Right. <laughs> of Goncharov, Ivan Goncharov's novel of 1859. 
Now, okay, the novel is over 500 pages long. And in fact, he does get out of bed, but only at about page 50. And he manages to go across, get across the room and sit in an armchair, I believe, right? And it's well towards the end of part two of the novel before he gets dressed. And that's only because his friend Stoltz came over and dragged him up to his feet and dressed him, right? So what, it, what to say about Oblomov, right? He's often described as indolent or lazy, but that's not quite right. He's not merely indolent. And his problem is not really one of laziness. And the fact that he suffers from ennui and melancholy as symptoms of his conditions, not its causes. He's also not acratic or weak-willed in the normal sense, right? Because his problem is not weakness of will so much as absence of will. His problem, I think, is that he's simply a passive observer of his own life, right? He's a very acute observer of the world in general and of himself in particular. But he simply observes things that happen to him rather than actively making things true. So he provides a very good example of the kind of person to whom Dick Jeffrey's logic of decision might actually apply, right? This is a sort of rhetorical point that Isaac Levi made long ago, right? When he said, the problem with Dick Jeffrey's logic of decision is that it's not a logic of decision, right? It's the logic of somebody who, like Ilya Ilyich Oblomov, is simply discovering, learning that certain things are happening to him when he has opinions about which of those things are good and which of them are bad. And I'd put it, you know, in the terms, um, in the terms of this talk, I think the issue is this. Oblomov is unable to occupy or maintain the deliberative stance. Does that make him irrational, right? I'm not sure. I don't think I don't think of it as irrationality. I think of it as a pathology of a certain kind of sort. But where defenders of causal decision theory used to say to their opponents, you say, if you're so smart, why am I not rich? And I say, look, this problem is simply, Newcomb's problem was simply set up to reward irrational people. I'm not sure that's quite right anymore. I think Newcomb's problem was set up to reward people like Oblomov, people who are able to avoid occupying the deliberative stance when they're thinking about what they're doing, people who are able to contemplate doing this or uh, this becoming true or that becoming true, etc., without thinking of somehow without thinking of themselves as having the agency to make this true or make that true and hence being able to think of what they're doing in a way that involves calculation of the goodness and badness of the various options that doesn't involve anything like imaging. So anyway, that's the end of what I prepared. Thanks to the various people who talked about this with me over the years. And the whole thing's in memory of my late friend Horacio Alocosta with whom I used to spend many happy hours talking about imaging back in the day. Thank you.